thing, Republicans and Democrat. It's very unfortunate that keeping kids out of the system doesn't seem to be bipartisan. And I think that the only way that we can achieve that is if we're very realistic about educating our communities. Everybody who's here today should be leaving here today making sure that they're educating at least one new person a day. Whether it's a neighbor, somebody at a store, I tend to talk to people at the bar. <laughs> Anywhere I find them, I, I try to educate as much as possible. I know there's a lot of good speakers here today and I know my friend Robbie over there is gonna drop some gems as well when he speaks. But if you take anything from what I've said today, let it be the fact that we have way too many kids that are currently locked up. If you take a look at Manson Youth Institute where they hold boys being charged as adults, it's 90% black boys, 90. We got 80% of them that have a mental health illness that hasn't been addressed. So let's just be very intentional about how we try to address this issue. Let's make sure that we put in the effort to educate as many people as possible. And let's make sure to never, never, ever, ever fall into the trap of thinking that kids are not kids. I feel like I've heard this conversation a lot for the last two years. We've been adultifying specifically kids of color at a way higher rate than their white peers. We need to pay attention to the fact that these, chi these children lack something that we can give them as a state, whether that's a safe home, whether that's a meal to put in their stomach, whether that's a mentor to lead them in the right direction, whatever it may be, we need to definitely look forward to pursuing only solutions that don't feed kids into our systems. I hope to connect with people here today. I love seeing new people. And thank you for having me, and I'm sorry that I gotta go, but I appreciate everybody for their presence. Thank you very much for speaking. I, uh, hopefully you've gotten a chance to meet people, and thank you for all the hard work you do. Uh, the other gentleman I'm going to take out of line, because he has an eight-hour drive right after this. He, uh, a, uh, he, he was coming. Uh, he didn't want to miss this event, uh, but he uh, had a death in the family, and he's going to be going uh, you know, up uh, very soon. So uh, I, I'd like to just introduce Mr. Wayne Winston. Thank you, Brian. I'm just gonna set this down over here. I wanna thank um, one Brian Donahue for putting together something like this because it always takes someone to do something and not talk about something to get something done. Right. There's a lot of people who plan, they plan the plan and they're gonna, gonna, gonna. It's better to have given it a shot and failed to not ever having done it because the best plans remain on the drawing board and that doesn't help anyone. I'm on a, um, a very special board. Um, one, we had so much racism in the state of Connecticut. Um, I knew a lot of people who were going through these things, teachers, educators across the state, and I was able to get a number of them together. The issues of hate that we're facing are all across this state. It happens in Fairfield. It happens in Guilford, where white supremacists took over that board. It happened in Middletown, it happened in Newtown. We are under, excuse me, we're under attack when it comes to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And as crazy as that should be, it should not be an issue, but it is. Because there are people who still don't believe that we should all be treated equal under the eyes of God or just under the eyes of humanity. I wound up finding the Anti-Racism Coalition of Connecticut and some of them are members here because we have something in common. We use the tools that we have to share amongst one another, the information that we get to help each other in our communities so that what's going on that's in Westport can be used up in Southbury or in Hartford. We often don't share those resources, but that's exactly what we do. You're gonna hear from some great speakers today. I'm from the, also fortunate enough to be on the board of the Harriet Tubman Learning Center in Powder Springs, Georgia, and I work with the descendant of Harriet Tubman. Probably about the most direct you ever get without her being here. Our discussions about where we are with race feel like we're running history all over again. We had the civil rights battle already. We had already sorted out that black people are human beings, that our stories have to be told. We have laws being passed in major states like Florida and Texas where you can't teach 
about Tulsa, Oklahoma, where you can't teach about what happened with Black Lives Matter or George Floyd in a classroom. There are teachers literally threatened with their jobs in Fairfield, Connecticut, for talking about what happened when Derek Chauvin kneeled on the neck of what started, of um, George Floyd, which started the very new civil rights challenges that we have right now. Because just as we saw it as vindication, the righteous people of all different colors, the other people on the right said we cannot have these truths being shown. We could not have the ugliness being taught from their perspective about equality and injustice. So that's why those key letters you see a lot, equity, diversity, inclusion, those are battle words for far right people. When I say far right, I don't mean just Republicans. I'm talking about the certified races that we have in this state, across this country, and they have named themselves. I didn't name the Proud Boys races. You look on their website, they tell you. You look on there for Oath Keepers, they tell you what they're against. They're not about seeing gay people as equals. They're not about seeing black people. They wanna shut down any discussion. And actually, when you talk about diversity and inclusion in schools, they call it an indoctrination to activism. And they're totally against it. And it's a rallying cry. They actually have a alphabet that they use that they used to invade our school systems. And it happened all during the COVID. And if you miss that, it's not hard to find. Just look it up onto internet. There's a guy out here that you'll be meeting pretty soon. He'll be speaking for Southbury. And he's, they're just amazing. If you haven't heard, these guys have been protesting over 200 weeks since George Floyd's death. You'll have a chance to get up and talk about this himself. I'm saying we, as a culture, should not have to fight this again, but you have to understand that the black community is under attack in particular. The laws that they're putting together address the issues of the history of education and by the governor of Florida. Thank you very much for that. The governor of Florida literally signs a bill that says you can't talk about racial issues or things that make white people uncomfortable in a school. So now, I thought we won that battle. I thought that's what Dr. King died for. I thought that was what the civil rights movement was for. We have a situation that we can win. It will not take an overnight because it's not a silver bullet. That school to prison pipeline is real. We know we have people standing there and here trying to fight to get it done, but you have to be active with your politicians. You have to be active in your system because that's what changes the laws. When you hear somebody say, black people in particular are always complaining, we've always had the access, I don't understand what the issue is, that same constitution that is held up when the greatest minds of the time, and maybe even up till now, decided to put this thing together, and they said, all men are created equal. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, except for black people. You will be labeled as slaves. You'll be counted as cattle. They were coming from a persecution from a country where they had kings and queens. That's the reason that they didn't create a parliamentary system here. But they found it was okay to pick out a group of people that they could identify by skin color and say, you know what? You guys are gonna build this country and we are going to get the benefits. So when we look throughout history and we've had to fight this thing back, that's where it started from. The great minds decided they were not going to make that decision and they were going to hurt black people in the process and we would just be the casualties. I'm going to say two more things. Our leaders are important and there's a friend of mine here, obviously he's not going to be able to speak, but he's here to make sure that you know 
we need to make a difference and just have people that care. Make sure that you see him before you leave because he's gonna make himself known. There's t-shirts around, so I won't say who that is. But I can tell you that he's in line with what we need in this country. And if you, nothing else that you do, make sure you connect with the groups that are here. Make sure you connect with Brian. Make sure you connect with these groups because we'll be doing more of these things and we need your help and your support. Please identify the folks in your community who you want to be the leaders and make sure that they get elected. So I want to thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, Wayne now has an eight hour drive, so we wish you the uh, peace during your travels up to uh, Buffalo. Thank you for so much for coming, and we'll be in touch. We also have one other chairman who had something, and that is uh, Anthony Morrissey. Can he come up? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Brian, for putting this together and bringing all these community leaders together. Uh, it's a pretty powerful day uh, when we bring all these great minds together. Uh, yes, my name is Coach Tony Morrissey. Uh, I am a U.S. Army veteran. I'm a foster care parent. We've adopted children, and I'm pretty proud, pretty proud dad. Um, I'm here today because I want to talk a little bit about what happens at the end of that pipeline that uh, folks have referred to. And, um, and also tell you about my foundation, which we founded uh, three years and three days ago when we lost my son, Brian Cody, to the overdose epidemic that is, uh, that is decimating America. Over the last 12 months, we've lost 100,000 Americans. That's more than in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq combined. And we, that happened in just the last year. What happens when we take a young person and we transport them into the, into the reformatory system is that they don't get the mentors, they don't get the love. They don't get what they need to develop and grow and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. But instead what happens is we put them in a box. We make them feel like they're inferior. The next thing you know, we cut them loose and they gotta figure all these things out themselves without having any of the support systems that they need. Um, and typically what happens is they can't get a good job they become homeless. They start, uh, they start um, you know, struggling with drug addiction. And in today's day and age, with the rise of fentanyl, that is a, that is a disaster uh, in the making. Uh, my, my organization, um, Brian Cody's Brothers and Sisters Foundation, um, is really just a coalition of thousands of grieving families that have been impacted by the opioid epidemic in the, in the worst possible way. And our mission is to ensure that we bring support and we bring love and we bring help to the people uh, that are struggling with this, uh, with this terrible disease called substance use disorder um, and, and also help their families. Uh, so we have, uh, we've over the last three years uh, done amazing things uh, as an organization, uh, reaching out to the schools uh, and, and learning about the children who have been impacted. There's a whole generation of children who have lost their mom and dad you can't, like, that. I, I, the schools are not ready for that. They're not prepared. You ask the school administrators what their plan is, they don't have one. Half the schools don't even have Narcan, okay? Uh, this is a big problem. So what we do is we work with a, a bunch of different organizations. Uh, we provide Youth Hero scholarships uh, for those children who have been impacted to help them move into the next chapter of their life. We work with people um, who have, have gone through the recovery journey uh, and are, are now willing and able to, to become mentors for those who are still struggling. We get them involved in the uh, recovery coaching certifications, so we sponsor that. Uh, we, we have support groups for families who have either lost a loved one or trying to figure out this world in which their loved one is struggling, trying to figure out the resources. We help people who are struggling directly. Uh, and we do anything that we can as much as we can. We, uh, we help get them into sober housing uh, after they're cut free from an inpatient setting. We help them get their license. We help them find jobs. We help them, we just basically show them love because really that's what this is all about. Um, there's just not enough love right now. And uh, you know, we're hoping that this coalition that you put together today, Brian, 
um, is is basically a, a mechanism for that, for us to basically reach out uh, within all of our communities and 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 help pick pick folks up and and uh, make sure that they have what they need. Uh, we have a bunch of things uh, that we do in our community and across the state of Connecticut. Uh, I do uh, I do invite you to look into our, our activities. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we got a big festival, an awareness festival going on, live music and art and. Um, you know, a ton of stuff for the kids, uh, and it's our way of, of basically raising awareness. Uh, you're all invited. Uh, we hope to see you there in New Milford on August 28th. Uh, but if we don't see you there, we do hope that our paths will cross because, you know, the work that you're doing, um, you know, all, all of the, the leaders here today, the work that you're doing is so incredibly important. We have a motto, a slogan, if you will, for our foundation. Um, and we actually have two. One is that we've learned that everyone knows someone. Everyone knows someone struggling in some kind of way. And because of that, you know, our motto is that we gotta keep going. We've got to keep going. Every day do something, as, as the gentleman said. Every day let's do something. Even if it's a little thing today, tomorrow it'll be a little bigger, and then before you know it, we're doing huge things across the state of Connecticut. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm asking you, please, just keep going. Thank you very much, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian, for all your help mission and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. I'm going to hand this back over to Corinne uh, Prescott from Power Up Connecticut. We went kind of out of line uh, because people had certain things they had but um, I'm going to ask Corinne to step up and uh, tell us to share her knowledge of this. Um, good afternoon. My name is Corinne Prescott. I am the founder of Power Up CT. Um, I live in Manchester aka Clanchester. Um, and that's like the birthing place for Power Up. Um, and we got started shortly after the murder of George Floyd, like many grassroots organizations that kind of have sprung up, not just in Connecticut, but across the country. Um, many people who started their grassroots organizations weren't new to organizing, um, but people like me who lived in a state as white as Connecticut and has children, um, I really was kind of trying to do my work in the background so I wouldn't um, allow my work affect my kids and their relationships that they had with their friends who were predominantly white. And until the murder happened, and I felt the, many of you may have heard the story already, um, but those who haven't, I literally felt my ancestors tell me to go. They literally just, that's the only word I've heard in my spirit was to go, but I knew exactly what it meant. And so one day, about three or four days after the murder of George Floyd, I decided, or I was led, called to show up in downtown Manchester um, to begin addressing the racism in our schools and the racism in our government and the racism amongst the citizens that live right in Manchester. I knew I could show up to Brooklyn, I could show up to Hartford, to New Haven, to Boston, to a great big BLM rally, but who was gonna come back to Manchester and show up for me and my kids? if I went elsewhere. So I knew I had to show up there. And so that is what I did. Um, and that's what I have been doing work in and out of Philadelphia DMV. I'm not born and raised in Connecticut and I know how Connecticut teens feel about outsiders um, coming in and stirring up trouble. I know how they feel me living in Manchester, showing up in Waterbury, showing up in Hartford. Um, and so there is this, um, it's very siloed in our state. It's even siloed amongst Democrats. It's even siloed amongst Republicans. It's siloed amongst black activists and organizers. And so that's one of the reasons why when Brian came to me so irate many months ago about the noose that was hanging from the tree behind the school, elementary school, the crack elementary school out in Enfield, I really wasn't that riled up and he was so angry. And, and I remember telling him, what else is new? They've been hanging nooses at the Amazon uh, uh, construction site in Windsor for months. They were hanging a noose. Those same workers went to Central Connecticut State University. They left Windsor, went to CCSU in New Britain, and hung a noose in New Britain. So when he tells me about a noose that was found in, Win in Enfield, I was numb at that point. And he was like, well, what are we going to do? And I'm like, well, listen, it's your people. What you going to do? I'll help you. I'll work with you. I'm doing what I need to do. The anger that he's feeling, I get it. But I've been doing this work so long that I'm starting to transition 
the anger. I'm starting to channel the anger in other directions. Um, and so one of those directions is policy. We know Connecticut is racist as hell. You could take out the three C's and put in three K's and it's still gonna spell Connecticut. And so one of the things that, that, that I have been very, I felt, I feel very strongly about is that as an organizer, as an activist, because they're not the same, and I am one of the very few people who can embody being an activist, an organizer, and an advocate. But one of the things that I realize is that showing up and rallying isn't enough. People stop showing up. This number is a great number for Connecticut. They stopped showing up about a month after George Floyd was murdered because COVID was no longer a thing and people wanted to get back to the bars and restaurants and clubs and travel and the beaches and the pools and so on and so forth. They wanted to get back to normal. But getting back to normal for black people means we're gonna go back to hanging from trees. Figuratively and literally. So there was no getting back to normal. And so that's why I'm saying, yes, we have to show up and rally, but we also have to show up at the polls. But showing up at the polls isn't enough because meanwhile, we're so fixated on what the Republicans are doing. They're doing this, they're doing that. Well, damn it, at least they're doing something because I don't see much coming from the Democrats. Which is why I changed my party affiliation and was very public about that. And they said, well, you know, you're not gonna be able to vote in primaries. I said, I know. That's rigged anyway, if you ask me. They already know who they picking for the primaries. We just believe that we have a real say so. I'm not saying don't participate, but I'm saying that you're not gonna dictate how I participate. So showing up to the polls isn't enough. So now I have encouraged people. I one day will follow this, this same encouragement, but now you gotta run. Showing up to vote isn't enough. Start with your school board. Start by organizing a neighborhood watch and be the president of that bitch. You gotta start somewhere. Oh, congratulations to the bride. Um, but in addition to that, I understand that while you're running for office, while you're voting, while you're showing up rally, people need justice today. People are hungry today. People need a place to live today. People need, need, need their gas in their car today. People need livable wages today. People need health care today. We don't have time for the legislative session. We don't have time for campaign season when they want to come out and they want to, they, they, they want to pander, especially to the black woman vote, and, and try to get us to move and act only during the campaign season. And then when the campaign season is over, you've exploited me and my following, and you've gotten the vote, and then months after that, you are no longer nowhere to be found. And then you have people like me, and people like Brian, and people like Chris showing up all year round, 365 days of the year, 28 hours, 10 days a week, showing up, doing the work behind the scenes, on the rally, passing out food to people who need it, trying to find people who can show up and protect and stand up constantly. But then where are our elected officials who claim that they work for us? So I showed up, January 6th, my personal story, at the Capitol. Because if you're no longer gonna come to my neighborhood because now that you got the vote, now I'm going to your neighborhood. So I showed up to my Capitol. I showed up minding my black business, me and another black woman to get the attention of Ned Lamont to say, hey, by executive order, you can and you should declare racism a public health crisis. And many black people said, what's the point? It's words on paper. I said, because you cannot cure what you cannot diagnose. And before we try to cure racism, we gotta at least name the thing. SROs in school is a symptom of racism. We can't address the SROs in school until we address white supremacy. We can't address the drugs in our community until we address the white supremacy. The drugs in our community is a symptom of white supremacy. We can't address people without homes until we address racism. People without homes is a symptom of white supremacy. We can't address capitalism until we address white supremacy. Because capitalism is a symptom of white supremacy. We can't address Roe v. Wade until we address white supremacy. Roe v. Wade being overturned is as a result of white people ignoring black women crying about our bodies for centuries. Roe v. Wade overturning is the reason why you have so many indigenous women and girls missing and entered into 
today. So I showed up with my sign and my megaphone, minding my business, seeing all these newly elected officials who I helped with my power and with my pool get elected. Never again, by the way, unless you're showing me the money, point blank period, for my organization. And I had a white woman minding her business some feet away, yelling freedom. I'm on trial now. Well, I'm not the one on trial. I'm the victim. Her lawyer asked me July, June, July 27th. We're in recess right now. What do you think was so funny that day when you were out there in front of the Capitol hearing white people say freedom? I said, well, I'm glad you asked. I said, hearing white people who stole land from indigenous people, then stole people from Africa, enslaved them, went from chattel slavery to Jim Crow, and you yelling freedom? Because people are asking you to wear a mask and get vaccinated? I said, hell yeah, I laughed. And so as I'm yelling Black Lives Matter, Black Health Matters, Black Teachers Matter, Black Children Matter, Black Queer People Matter, Black Trans People Matter, this white woman said all lives matter. I ignored that. Say whatever you want. She continued to say all lives matter. I could let care less because we all have the right to be out there for whatever we want. It's all of our capital. But when she said, what about black on black crime? I took that as her wanting to know more. I took that as an opportunity to educate. And I stopped and I turned to her and she was still several feet away from me. And I said, there's no such thing as black on black crime. She said, black lives can't matter. Again, black on black crime. I said, we don't call it white on white crime when you have these quote unquote, and as somebody who has PTSD, anxiety, depression, chronic depression, I get real pissed off when we label these white boys as mental health issues when they're going up and shooting up schools. But we don't call it white on white crime when it's that. When it's two men fighting, we don't call it man on man crime. We don't call it lesbian on lesbian crime. What do we call them as police officers who are going home beating up their wives? We don't call that crime out. And she got mad at that. And she was probably about where you are in the peak. She made her way over to me and I said to her, back up several times. And I'm looking at the officer because at this point, the crowd is going crazy. The numbers went, when I got there, it was just several people out front. The crowd was in the back, but by this time they made their way to the front. So now there is a barrier in front of us, metal gates in front of us, and now we have the police making a perimeter. And it just so happened that there was a white male officer standing directly in front of me. I don't know his pronouns, but I'm, so I'm gonna just say they. There was an officer who appeared to be a male standing in front of me. And so I'm looking at the officer because I want to make sure, I understand I live in America, so I need to make sure my hands and my body language is in such a way that he understands that I am not a threat, but I am prepared to defend myself should the need arise. And so while I'm talking to her and I'm looking at the officer, I'm telling this white woman repeatedly, back up. And eventually I tell her to back the fuck up. I said, you and your baby get out of here. You do not have on a mask. You are in my personal space. And in that moment, she looks behind her. She turns to me and she spits directly in my face. Thank God I was wearing glasses because I'm blind and because I believe COVID is real, I was wearing a mask. Had I not, her spit would have went into my eye and into my mouth. And when I turned to go after her, then and only then was I met with her friends and ended up in a tussle with a group of white women. And that's when the police came over and held me to usher this white woman to safety. When I tried to explain to the police what happened, they told me that they didn't have evidence even though the spit was on my face. They said if I caught it on camera, they could do something. The last I checked, police are arresting black and brown children, black and brown men and women for far less with absolutely no evidence. But somehow when a black woman speaks up, nobody wants to listen and nobody wants to believe them. It took white women angry, going past the barrier, putting their hands in officers' faces to do something. And when they approached this white woman who, who committed a hate crime against me, she was pushing them away, she was moving her arm like this. Had I resisted an officer like that, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. I would be a hashtag. That was in Hartford. 
where black people should feel safe from white supremacy. So if I can't feel safe in an urban environment like white supremacy, how the hell am I feel safe anywhere in Connecticut, let alone America? Showed up yesterday, speaking of New Haven County, a large group of black people, black professionals showed up at the beach at Hammonasset yesterday. You can go to my page and you can see the video and you can see the pictures and see the live. First of all, let me explain something to you about black people, especially black women. We go to the beach and pool, but not to get in. Especially, it don't even matter what type of hairstyle, whether you want on, whether you got a weave or you got your fro, you're not getting in. Your face is beat for the gods. Lipstick is popping. Shake, sis no, sis already know, that's why she laughing. Our outfits are not meant to get it wet. Yes, it is a bathing suit, but it is not meant to get wet. We are there strictly to mingle, have a good time, and take amazing pictures, and to embrace the energy of black joy. It was a family-friendly event. In fact, my 11-year-old daughter and my 17-year-old daughter, I brought them. There were other children there. My 11-year-old daughter was beating these grown women in hula hooping contests. It was a family event until the Rangers showed up. Were we smoking hookah? Yes, we were. Last time I checked, hookah is not illegal. Were we smoking cigars? Yes, we were. The Rangers showed up and started walking through only our area. The Rangers went back and got, I don't know, what's that, Clinton? Him and Acid isn't Clinton? Madison. 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 They went and got Clinton and Madison police. From there, they got the state police and they walked over. The captain came over to who they believe organized this crowd. And they said, you have an hour to pack everybody up and get out of here. My question was, how do you know we all together? I'm looking up and down the beach. It was a beautiful day. How, how, how do you know that we are together? It's a public beach. They told us we're doing you a favor, a courtesy by not arresting you. On my video, when I walk out of the beach, they had a 12 passenger van out there. They did not come to deescalate. They came to antagonize. They came in plainclothes officers as well. They had at least maybe 10 to 12 um, pickup trucks and SUVs out there. Now, if it was music, if they, they said that they smelled weed, no, they got a complaint. They got an anonymous complaint that they smelled weed. They got an anonymous complaint that people were falling over drunk. The videos are there on my page. First of all, the scene was too hot to walk around. So people started packing up by myself and there was a policy director from the ACLU as well as other lawyers and we got permission from the organizers to challenge them. And so we're gonna figure out how we're gonna follow but many of us left. And once the majority of us left, the cops who were there to shut us down because of noise complaint then asked to do the electric slide. So now the music isn't an issue And so they proceeded to do the electric slide once there weren't as many black people there. This is Connecticut. This is a blue state. This is supposed to be a progressive state. So when he came to me and said we must do something, at that point in time, the neo-Nazis were showing up in different parts of Connecticut, dropping their literature. And there were many other things happening in many of the counties. And we said, listen, we're gonna do something. And Brian and I agreed that we're not gonna just do something at the Capitol. We're gonna show up in every single county in Connecticut. Because we know that the media really isn't shit. And they pick and choose what they wanna share. And they're not sharing our stories of hate. Just about every single person I know who was a victim of a hate crime in Connecticut the attacker got nothing more than a misdemeanor. The woman who spit on me, the, lawyer, the, the, the judge was white and she said, I don't want to ruin her life any more than it has already been ruined. So as long as she goes to her, essentially it's called AR, but what it really is is like anger management classes. She goes to those classes for two years and her record is wiped clean. Again, my name is Corinne Prescott. Thank you, I took more time than what I planned to. We're showing up in Middlesex County, I believe, or New, New, 
no, Clearfield County next. Um, I'm Power Up C Team, and you can follow us. You can follow Brian's organization in, in, in JU. If you once you come up after me, please share your information so that way we can make the connections. That's all. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we're um, in the program. We're going to talk to Robert Goodridge, uh, who works with Black and Latino and um, you know uh, youths who have uh, been attacked uh, legislatively last year. So we don't do it. We, we, this is one of the reasons we're doing this, is so that we, we get the issues out. But we're also going to do a follow up. I'm going to ask also if, during the time if no one has um, is not registered to vote. Uh, Common Cause Connecticut has a booth, and they are uh, uh, signing people up to vote because it's really uh, your voices that need to show up, and you guys all, including me, need to show up at the election poll. So, Robert Goodrich, if you could come up, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Robbie Goodrich, and I am one of the co-founders of RACE, which is short for Radical Advocates for Cross-Cultural Education. We're a Waterbury-based organizing and advocacy organization that fights for racial equity and social justice in our schools. Before I get into a little bit of our rally today, I wanted to share some, some gifts with the organizers of today's events, which are uh, kufiyas from the last garment factory in Palestine. And um, there's a story associated with each of the patterns and colors, and it's something that uh, I like to share and, and, and to be fair to, to support our brothers and sisters in, in, in Palestine. Um, so there's many people here that I do not know, but there are people here that I do know. I wanted to acknowledge uh, my son, Caden, my, one of our board members, Ty. Race has a board of directors made up of young people of color under the age of 26. I'd like to sort of give a shout out to Leora, one of the badasses here in the state of Connecticut, a good friend and a front lines advocate and activist uh, who I really appreciate. And my brother Fahad, inshallah, may God be with you, my brother. So I, I'm going to ask you all to take out your phones. The last time we had a rally in Waterbury, I had everyone text the mayor on his personal cell phone. We are not going to do that today. He has since changed his personal cell phone number and I don't have it. But because what Corinne has talked about and others will talk about, showing up is okay. Following up and building a culture here in Connecticut that is focused on organizing and advocacy to combat racism and white supremacy requires that we follow up and work with each other. Even folks we don't like. So I want you to and show up as allies. Because unlike many places in Connecticut and in many organizers and small organizations, race is not willing to be siloed. It is just too damn dangerous here in Waterbury. Five, two, eight, eight, six. And you're gonna text R-A-C-C-E to 52886. So we're here at a rally. So there's a couple of things that I want us to start chanting. The first is when we fight, when we fight, we win. We win. When we fight, when we fight, when we fight. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Call yeah, call I say when we fight, you say we win. When we fight, we win. When we fight. We win. The other refrain or chant that I want you to join me in is no more kneel. Can you all yell that for me? No, no more, more kneel. kneel. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Waterbury. So you're standing, okay, today at ground zero of the school to prison pipeline. 
the Waterbury Public Schools as a former teacher here in Waterbury and seven years of running this organization. We arrest the most students in the state of Connecticut and the pipeline is filled here in Waterbury. We also have the most adults incarcerated in the Department of Corrections in Connecticut that share Waterbury has a home as a home address. So when I say no more Neil, we're pointing at Neil O'Leary, the mayor, who's also the former police chief. So when we say let's end the school to prison pipeline, we're gonna say no more Neil. No more, no Neil. more Neil. So we chose education, Arlene and Shante, two black women who founded the organization, as the primary issue to combat racism and white supremacy in, in Waterbury was because we believe that education and our systems of education sit at right in the center of the intersection of all the other systems of oppression. So here in Waterbury, I, w I need to remind folks that we also had the highest number of deaths from COVID in the state of Connecticut. No more, Neil. No more, no more Neil. Neil. We also have some of the lowest voter turnout in the state from municipal elections, state elections, and federal elections. No more, Neil. No more, Neil. We have investments being made in people from out of the state. As you sit here, as we speak right now, there are New York-based investors taking control of downtown Waterbury buildings. No more, Neil! No. Tens of millions of dollars in tax credits, grants, and city funding is being misdirected from city residents into the hands of wealthy landlords. No, no more, no. Neil! No more, Neil! What else do we have here that happens in Waterbury that is very unique? Is that it's very difficult to organize around social justice issues. So we talk about what happened after George Floyd. And we had this enlightened spirit of white people all across Connecticut coming to the front lines. Here in Waterbury, during a peaceful protest of thousands of people, the police department ordered the arrest of 28 peaceful protesters. No more, Neil! No more, Neil! So, I can give you a myriad of data. I can talk, talk to you about how since Neil Leary's become mayor, the average household income has dropped from $57,000 per family down to $41,000 per family. No more, Neil! No more, Neil! I can talk to you about students' performance issues, the racist outcomes that students of color and poor students and English language learners have to endure here in Waterbury. I'm not gonna do that. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is stay connected to the grassroots organizers, participate in our advocacy campaigns, show up in the places that we cannot and carry our message. Make the young people that are on the front lines feel supported, not just emotionally, but socially and financially. Because when we fight, when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Thank you, everyone. Is there a Charnel Bush here? No, he is not here. Okay. So we, uh, the next person, uh, hopefully she's here. Her name is Miss Sita from the founder of COPE, Carried at Opiate Preventable uh, Epidemic in Bridgeport. Is she here? Okay. I, well, what I would like to do is have uh, our other co-sponsor, uh, Mr. Said, uh, come up and uh, be able to speak from a religious perspective of what is going on and how the church uh, and the religious faith leaders can show up and what do we need from them and what do they need from us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, 
the most gracious, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum, which means the greeting of peace and blessings be upon you. Uh, I'm looking out in the crowd and I see some great signs, smash white supremacy. Excellent, we need to smash it because white supremacy is embodied in everywhere, mostly in this country. We have to look at icons like Malcolm X and people like Malcolm X who spoke the truth and said that when you start to speak the truth, get ready and get prepared. Uh, I've been rallying for years and years, well, and I know many of the leaders all across Connecticut and out of Connecticut. And as, and as a matter of fact, on a national level, brothers and sisters, hate is real. You know, after 9-11, most of the people in my uh, community were targeted. Uh, the majority of our kids are targeted, bullied in school. Uh, they did a, a survey uh, here in Connecticut where a couple hundred kids were questioned regarding bully. And the majority of the kids were bullied solely based on our race and religion. And then you have law enforcement that comes and act like they're buddy buddy to our community. But unfortunately, they target our community. And when you try to reach out for help, just in case if your kid got assaulted or this and that, you become the person that is investigated instead of the person who needs help. You know, I, I'm gonna speak briefly because that's what I have to do for now. But brothers and sisters, your Muslim brothers and sisters are in pain. You know, we're struggling, the struggle is real. But we're right here, you know, we're fighting the fight. And if this is our last breath to do, to fight for equality and justice, and that's what we gotta do. And to eliminate some of these politicians that don't really work for us and only come during electable times, we need to knock on every single one of these doors. We need to go reach out to them, reach out to voters, and we need to become the elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. I am next going to another faith leader. Her name is Nancy Burton. She's a member of the Unitarian Universalist of Meriden Racial Justice Committee. Can you please come up? Hi, these have been some tough acts to follow. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot we have to do. Um, I was asked to speak um, about the work we've been doing. I'm also on the board of the Universal Healthcare Foundation, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that foundation first. We are in a process right now of making sure that we are an anti-racist organization, that we have an anti-racist lens to everything we do. We have also, probably in the past, focused a lot on policy and legislative work, and we realize that we have to refocus a bit on power building and grassroots organizing, and so we're doing a a real change in how we approach this so that we um, we can build power and, and accomplish more because this is our main focus is getting health care for everyone it's clear that there are communities that are more have suffered more and need to be focused on even more than more but and then we want everyone to have access to health care at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Meriden we have a social justice council and we have not really been involved in um, the, the uh, school to prison pipeline um, work. That doesn't mean we can't be in the future. It hasn't been a focus of ours. We have focused on um, LGBTQ rights, uh, universal health care, um, and we're very involved in immigrants' rights. We had a couple living in our church for almost two years in sanctuary, um, and they were able to get um, a green card and to stay. This was a man who had been in this country for 30 years, checking in like he should every year. And all of a sudden they changed it and they were about to ship him back to Indonesia, a country he hadn't been in in 30 years. And um, that was quite a struggle, but we won. And <laughs> so, during the pandemic, we um, organized um, fundraising to help the undocumented folks in our community because they were not getting any of the benefits that, that were coming through the federal government. And so we had fundraising to just help them with the basics of life, 
food, rent, um, situations like that. So that was our real focus for a long time. Lately, we've been focusing a lot more on anti-racism. And we are now working on a unity rally. We're working with the NAACP and the Racial Justice Initiative of Meriden. This kind of got spurred on when flyers showed up in town from a white male, white supremacist organization recruiting. And we thought, uh-uh. So we've gotten together with these, these other organizations. We're planning a unity rally on September 17th on the Meriden Green from 2 to 4. We hope you'll all join us because we're basically showing that we are a multicultural, multiracial community and we're proud of it. And this is not a place to come to recruit for white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, very much. Um, now we're going to talk about community leaders. And one man uh, who I have a lot of respect for, he's been at all the rallies, and his name is Christopher Duke. Uh, Christopher, if you could come up now. Good afternoon, Waterbury. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Dukes, and if you are an American, if you are hopefully a, a maybe a father even, a husband or so, you can relate to my story. I will take the time to share just a brief part of it. It's very complicated. So imagine yourself in your home. You're a homeowner. You're on the phone with your mother. And unbeknownst to you, a SWAT team is assembling outside of your home. You're on the phone telling your mother that your then wife is having an affair and that angry individual in the same style of what happened to Emmett Till used her anger, in this case, used her anger and her privilege to weaponize our law enforcement community to believing she was harmed by a dangerous, drunken black man. This is real. We talk about the pipeline. We've talked about this pipeline to jail. I escaped that pipeline. I'm a New Haven native, born and raised. Worked my way through high school, got to college, graduated college, got a job at that college, invested 22 years in a career at the same college, became a high-ranking official, put my kids to bed one night, my house is surrounded by police department who are acting out of, not say immaturity, I don't blame them how they acted out. They got a 911 call and they responded. The problem is, is when they realize that that 911 call was fake, they hid the information. When the prosecutors found out that the woman that they believed was a victim was actually a cheating spouse who intended of having her husband and their children killed by SWAT team. That's a felony in the state of Connecticut. It's called swatting. All the elements were satisfied. They refused to charge this woman for swatting because of how it looks to put a woman on trial for that. This case happened before we ever heard of George Floyd. This case happened before Christian Cooper was accused of threatening a white woman in Central Park. This case happened before anyone heard the name Jennifer Dulos, Fulos Dulos, in this state of Connecticut and we've been fighting it ever since. So I was supposed to begin with telling you about, and I had to write it down because otherwise I can get very emotional about this case. I'm still concerned about my children. I end up losing my home, my children, my job of 22 years, and I've been fighting ever since to get it all back because I'm a firm believer. If they can do it to me, they can do it to you. And so it's my job, this is my journey to make sure that I live up to the person that my creator made me to be. That I make sure that I fulfill this journey to make sure that we end hate across this state. That, the, thank you. That the people who have the courage to put on the uniform 
and protect our freedoms. That that hard work was never done in vain. That we can live here. So in the spirit of liberty and justice for all, I offer this remark that is written from uh, Martin Yant. What is kept in the public eye, or what is kept from the public eye, is the truth that thousands of innocent Americans are sent to prison every year. These incidences are usually a product of prejudice, outrageous carelessness, discredited investigative techniques, and worst of all, the desire of some police and some prosecutors to win convictions at any price. This is a problem that's relative to all of us. We as Connecticut citizens all have a problem with this, and we all have the ability to take corrective steps towards eliminating this issue. One of them, as Corinne stated earlier, is working through policy. So I have been working on developing a nonprofit. We have our recognition. I'm looking at turning into what was meant to harm me into something that's good for me and everyone else. My company is going to make sure that we do as much as we can in this state and throughout this country to make sure not one more innocent individual is sent to prison or uh, assess excessive bail or all the techniques they use as a chokehold to get innocent people to, com to take plea bargains because the state or the federal government puts a chokehold on them that makes them submit even though they're innocent. So, the police contracts is an area that we can all pay attention to. There's an organization called Campaign Zero. They have done the hard work for all of us. They have narrowed down six elements in police contracts that should be removed. Some of them have Bill of Rights where they should be removed. I'm a union person. I do believe that all people involved in a union should receive fair wages and health benefits. However, not at the expense of the constitutional rights of us citizens who do not work in those professions. We all need to be protected. So what I would like to say is what we should be able to do is make sure that all police contracts have any content that prohibit transparency and accountability to be removed. As citizens, we can pay attention to that. As organizations, we can collaborate to make sure that's taken care of. Another area of concentration is our media. Our media, in my opinion, have been absolutely disgusting in terms of how they assassinate the characters and the images of black and brown people in this state. They make they make it to the point where people are made to feel uncomfortable. In my case, they made it seem like, oh my God, we got another dangerous black man, runaway slave, who's a threat to every person in America. We need to stop that. We need to make sure that we hold them accountable for how they poison potential jury pools, how they, they salivate on the idea of having a story that this black man or this black or brown man is the devil and is a threat to our way of living and that we are here to rape and pillage uh, villages. That's time for that to be gone. Lastly, I personally, and I've heard other people say this, can no longer stand by the politicians who solicit our votes and then take an oath when we successfully get them in office. And that oath says that they will defend and uphold the United States Constitution. And then when you call them for help and you let them know, in my case, my children were taken away from me. My children are in harm. DCF is involved. Hartford Police is involved. Central Connecticut State University is involved. Uh, the state attorney's office is involved. The state, the chief state attorney is involved. And people like a Ned Lamont has ignored this for the last four years. I made sure he couldn't say he didn't know about it. Susan Bicewitz, I just spoke to her in person just about three weeks ago at another event, not in passing, 
talking to her, shaking her hand, talking to her, reminding her who I am and who my children are. She has ignored this. Our politicians are afraid to stand up for our rights. They're afraid to say we stand by black and brown people who are subjected to white supremacy and all the symptoms that Christine, I mean Christine, that Corinne had mentioned are all there and are still applicable to us every single day. We need to do better and we can. I'm glad to be a part of the solution. Thank me, thank you for having me here, Brian, today. And I look forward to connecting with a lot of other people because we do, we're a small state. We have a lot of work to do. Be on the lookout for Justice for Dukes. You're gonna hear a lot from us um, over the next couple of months because we have three major court cases that are coming up in New Haven County. Um, in case you're wondering, the, the woman who swatted me and my children, who the state refuses to prosecute for how it may look, even though that's the right thing to do, that woman will be on trial in New Haven on September 13th for malicious prosecution. We will be at the state Supreme Court in probably October because the state university who's being defended by our attorney general's office who has allowed a rapist to remain on staff, promoted, and featured in commercials while getting rid of an innocent black man, that case comes open in October as well. So you're gonna hear a lot more about us. This has been going on, again, this is before George Floyd, but because Connecticut is so full of corruption, this can still be going on today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the next gentleman, uh, looking at my thing, uh, he is, his name is Adam Antar from the Bristol Anti-Racism Brigade in law offices of Maryam Bittar. He's worked on Palestine solidarity and anti-police violence for many years. Uh, Adam, please come up. All right, it's nice to see everybody out here. Um, I kind of want to start with like a funny little concept. Uh, we know that Mar-a-Lago got raided by the FBI and we've seen a bunch of Republicans uh, shouting defund the FBI. And as a Muslim who grew up during the 9-11 during the era and had to deal with that aftermath, it's kind of like, oh, welcome, welcome to the club. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, I'm here representing the Bristol Anti-Racism Brigade, or BARB. Roughly two and a half months ago, a violent neo-Nazi organization calling themselves the New England Nationalist Social Club left leaflets in a number of neighborhoods in Bristol. Newspapers put, stated that they leafleted in 16 towns in Connecticut, while the neo-Nazis themselves on their website have stated they, they leafleted over 100 different towns throughout Connecticut. These le leaflets were left behind in, right behind the middle school that I attended, right next to my parents' home. The brother of one of our founders found the leaflets and went to the police. The police didn't do anything. Their job is not to prevent crime, it's simply to maintain the systems of oppression. We then went to seek help from our city officials. The mayor flat out refused to meet with us, so we began to organize a demonstration outside of City Hall. Through the power of the people and outrage, the mayor acquiesced and held a meeting. It was fruitless. His stance was to just brush it off and brush it under the rug and to ignore it. I ask you, can we brush slavery under the ground or is that how we get Jim Crow? Can we brush slave patrols under the rug or is that how we have prison, prison labor and police shootings? His response was tone deaf and ignorant to say the least. We put together a resolution for the city council which condemned white supremacy and called for ensuring that all people feel welcomed and safe in our town and proposed active steps that the city could take. The resolution was non-binding, but he could not do that. The mayor and city council refused to vote on it. There was a complete lack of political will to substantively denounce neo-Nazis. Imagine that. You can't denounce neo-Nazis. So we continue to organize. We've had, we have a two-pronged method for action. I'm no longer interested in working with, these, with the racists pulling the levers of a white supremacist government. I'm not interested in working with our city council members or any of these elected officials because they've shown time and time again, as many of the other speakers have said, they are unwilling to do anything about it because it alienates some of their, vo their voting base, which are white supremacists. So the first prong is that we have begun focusing on the Board of Education and fighting for a more holistic curriculum so that we can nip bigotry in the bud before these kids grow up repeating what Tucker Carlson says on TV. 
This also includes future plans for canvassing and door knocking. So we're going to go out. We have our own hotline for if, if there's incident occurs, you can call the hotline and we will appropriately respond to it. Unlike the neo-Nazis, this is our home and we are not afraid to show our faces. The second prong is self-defense. As somebody had pointed out earlier, I believe it was Corinne, that we need to address the situations now. Neo-Nazis are rampant. White supremacists, you will meet them throughout the city. They don't they're not shy. If you're black or brown, they will make their opinions known. So we need to be, we need to have self-defense now. We can't just wait for the next generation to figure out that racism is wrong. We have to wake up and smell the hummus. These white nationalists are everywhere, and they are violent. Any black or brown person will tell you this fact. Barb, through the Self-Defense Brigade, and Cornell Lewis have begun self-defense training in order to make sure that we can secure ourselves. Again, because the police don't do it, our elected politicians don't do it, we are left to resort to ourselves. Organizations like the John Brown Gun Club and the Self-Defense Brigade are vital for the survival of our movements. We cannot go peacefully towards fascism. This is a war. You've seen it in Buffalo. Hell, a few months ago, this same event in Hartford was tar targeted by white nationalists, who apparently came from Bristol, and several speakers dropped out. Fuck that cowardice. We must stand tall in the face of adversity and link arms with people who know what is at stake in these struggles. Our lives. Fuck neo-Nazis. I'm here to advocate for the dismantling of the white supremacist state, a system of violence which oppresses all people of color and even impoverished white people, a system which upholds the patriarchy. Fuck neo-Nazis. The cute part is that they think they're all that, that they hold the power. And I'm here to say today, no, we hold the power. Whose streets are these? Our streets. Whose streets are these? Our streets. Fuck neo-Nazis. We gotta remember our roots. Remember that we came together for something that fascists will never understand. Love. Love for one another. Acceptance, not tolerance. Fuck tolerance. Rather, unquestioning acceptance for who we are and the autonomy to act as who we are. Love. We need to come together. We share a common goal. Regardless of what cause brought us here together in this moment, we stand in opposition against neo-Nazis. Fuck neo-Nazis! And we will do so tact tactfully, tactically, strategically, and intelligently. Because we have a secret weapon against fascists. Love. Have confidence that as leftists, or whatever you want to call yourself, we have come together to support one another, to support humanity. The rising tide of fascism is only concerned with the maintenance of legalized theft and an unjust hierarchy. Fascism is, fascism is nothing but the cowardly thrashing of the privileged classes against the inevitable crashing wave of equity and equality. We will win. Please share your emails, but be cautious. Get to know one another, but at the same time, be cautious. Fuck neo-Nazis. Thank you, Adam, for your words. I think it has a lot of wisdom. I had a, over Memorial Day, I had a, uh, had a uh, you know, some hours on a Sunday, and I heard about a group called uh, Justice Southbury. And it was, a, I came, and they had wonderful speakers, and they had wonderful, uh, I had a, it really spoke to the heart. And so today we have, I asked him to come, and he agreed that he would show up is a uh, Mr. Richard Randolph from the Justice Southbury. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Corinne, for organizing this. And thank you for all who spoke. Um, I have a feeling after the passion of the last few speakers, I'm going to disappoint you, uh, because uh, I'm about as you know privileged a white, straight, upper middle class dude as you can get, and certainly that's probably speaking here today. Um, but 117 weeks ago, that's kind of all I was. I was like a lot of people who had a lot of, a lot of opinions. I read a lot, I thought a lot, I spoke a lot, um, but I didn't do a lot. Um, and then George Floyd was murdered. And like most places across the country, um, there was an impromptu gathering on the Sunday after he was murdered. And we had about 180 people in, show up in Southbury, in our 94% in our white town of Southbury. And my daughter posted on Instagram afterwards, said, this is what I did today. And a bunch of her friends said, I wish I'd known about that. Can you do it again? So she said, Dad, Dad, can we do that? 
I said, sure, why not? So week two, uh, we went out there. We, we gathered the signs they'd used the week before, and we, we rallied with, uh, with 250 people because we thought that was our rally. Um, and then as a, a, an older couple, literally in their early 90s, was walking away with a couple of the signs. And my daughter said, Dad, they're stealing signs. And, we, Ju and Julie and I went over to them and said, uh, can we help you? Do you want us to put the signs back for you? And they said, no, it's OK. We'll just bring them next week. And Julie looked at me and said, Dad, is there going to be a next week? I said, well, I guess now there has to be. And tomorrow is consecutive week number 116. We've been out there every Sunday. A couple of few of you have been, been to our rallies. We've been there every Sunday ever since. We, are, we mostly have uh, rallies where we say Black Lives Matter. Uh, when people say, why do you say Black Lives Matter? We say, well, because it's, it's easier than saying all lives can't truly matter until black lives and white lives matter equally, which is what we would say. But you know, it's either, easier to say BLM than say A-L-C-T-M-V-B-A-W-L-M-E. When people pass us in the cars and they shout out, all lives matter, we shout back equally. And they don't like that. We've had pride rallies. We've had women's health rallies. We've had stop Asian hate rallies. Our signs say black lives matter in rainbow colors. Our signs say love your neighbor in red, white, and blue. I stand there each week with my, my red, white, and blue love your neighbor sign and my American flag, and I get the finger from some people, not all. We found that there's really three groups in the community. There is the group that hates everything we do and everything we stand for. And we will never change their minds, not even 1%. We can say, we can say fuck neo-Nazis as many times as we want, and they're going to still be there. There's a group like the ones here who love probably just about everything we do and the way we're doing it and want to be a part of it. And then there's a third really big group that says, Man, oh man, it seems like there's a lot of hate on both sides, and I'm nervous. I kind of like what you're saying. I kind of like, you know, love your neighbor, but I don't know, you know, black guys, I don't know. This is kind of scary, and aren't you guys hateful as well? And so that's kind of the group we're working on the most. We'll never get the haters, and we got the lovers, but we're really trying to work on the messaging for the silent group of people who would drive by something like this and be scared, might be supportive of the general concept, but be scared about some of this stuff. So to those who think that, to those that, that we would say want to stoke hate, they ironically say, we're the focus of hate. They say, you know, South Korea didn't have hate until you guys showed up. Um, the, the message that we developed, the, the message of love your neighbor was chosen very specifically. It's not so much a, a, you know, a religious thing, although obviously there's, there's religion to it. But we kind of thought if we're going to be about communication, we're going to be about uh, communicating a message, we've got to start with somewhere where I can challenge anybody. You don't want a part of that? Tell me what part of love your neighbor don't you want. And if I got you to say, okay, love your neighbor, then I got you. Because the next step is easy, and the next step is easy, and they don't realize it until you're 20 steps down the road, and they're saying, shit, maybe black lives do matter. So messaging, we found, is really, really important. One of the things we do on social media is with, and I'm sure you guys on social media see a lot of this, you know, you suck. Well, you su suck worse. Well, you suck double worse. You know, that's, that's a lot of the, con the conversations. We try to ask questions. When people tell me I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, I'm a this, I'm a that, none of which I am, I say, well, you know, tell me, tell me why you say that. What's your, you know, what, tell me where you're coming from. Um, these conversations um, led us to a situation where there was a, a guy who came to one of our rallies um, and started walking up and down the line, yelling each and one of our faces, all lives matter, all lives matter, all lives matter, all lives, to every one of us. Um, and since my job is, you know, one of my many jobs is I'm a big beefy guy, <laughs> I need you, Christopher, to help me next time. Uh, I'm the enforcer, so I had to go. I got, got up in his face, and I yelled, all lives matter. And he yelled, all lives matter. And I said, white lives matter. And he said, white lives matter. And I said, blue lives matter. And he said, blue lives matter. And I said, black lives matter. And he said, all lives matter. And I said, see, you can't say it. You cannot say it. And when we have those kinds of conversations, when I put that on Facebook, and when someone says all lives matter, and I say, well, okay, and I, and I again, I throw the little crumbs. Will you say blue lives matter? Sure. Will you say, well, sure, but will you say black lives matter? And we're trying to do things and have conversations in such a way 
that the people that love what we're doing are still going to love it. The people that hate what we're doing are still going to hate it. But the people who are scared and say, I'm not sure why you're doing it or what, your out what is the outcome you want. What's, what's ahead of America if we, if we line up with you guys? Um, what we're trying to do is let them understand that if you love your neighbor, if you really do believe all lives matter, if you talk about, about values with us, I'll have a values off with anybody. And we get to these kinds of conversations that are really important to moving things forward. So um, I think the persistence has paid off. Um, there's something about showing up. There's something about being there for, again, tomorrow's week number 116. Um, and I don't know when we're going to stop, but we're going to stop when, uh, when we don't need to do it anymore. So I think we're going we're gonna to be there. Uh, I don't want to say tell I'm an old man because I'm already an old man, but when I'm an old or much older man. Uh, but a couple of concrete things that have happened. We do a lot of, of things other than the rallies, but a couple of concrete things that have happened. There are two families who sp of color who moved to Lily White Southbury because of Justice Southbury. And as they were driving around through the communities uh, looking for a new home, coming out of the city during COVID, looking for a new home, and they passed our rally and said, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and they came up and they looked in other towns and they drove around again. And where we are, you, you kind of you drive by us if you're driving anywhere near there. And on another week, they pass us, and they, we were there again. And I've had two families tell me, because you guys were there, we got, we got a sense that this town could be friendly to us. Uh, so that's really something that we've tried to do. So um, two of the quotes that have, that have really uh, given us incentive from the beginning. Martin Luther King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And we've taken that to heart, and I, and I think everybody here who's given up a, a Saturday in August has done that as well. You've, you've agreed not to remain silent. You are friends who will not be silent. And a guy came to one of our first rallies with a sign that said, if you ever wondered what you would do during the Holocaust or during the Civil Rights Movement, if you ever wondered what you would have done, you're doing it now. So... The people that care about what's going on, the people care about making this country a better place, are here and are at our rally tomorrow and are at all of your organizations, the things that you guys are doing. You're doing what you can to make this a better world. And, and therefore, what would you have done during the civil rights, the civil rights era? This. You would have been here speaking with a microphone. So. Um, Thank you all for what you're doing to end hate across the state, and I hope we'll keep doing our little part as well. Thanks. Thank you, Rick, very much. Um, the next uh, speaker I would like to uh, have come up is from the Justice Middlebury, Thomas Gaberti. Thank you so much. I just want to first say thank you so much to Brian for getting me out here, for organizing this wonderful event. And big thanks definitely to, where is he? Rick, he's basically the reason why this organization exists. Can we please give a big round of applause for him? And before I start my speech today, I just want to acknowledge someone that wasn't able to be here today um, because of a family emergency. His name is Jarnell Bush. And the reason why I bring him up is because he is someone that's also very important to this. Now, as a previous speaker was talking about, uh, we have a mayor, there's a mayor in Waterbury named Neil O'Leary, who, from what I've seen, is basically a barrier to a lot of progress. But I want to bring up someone else here who, of course, is not here today, who should be here today, Senator Joanne Hartley. And I think I have a good reason why she is not here. I think I know why. A year ago, after George Floyd happened, the CT legislator finally decided that now was the time to respond and to address this and brought up a police accountability bill. Now that bill was skinny the bunch. It was, you know, breaking down just like any other piece of legislation, but they were finally able to get a vote on it. Joanne Hartley, the state senator for this place here, was the only Democrat to vote against that. The only Democrat. And how Charnel relates to this is he is, for the first time in her 20 years as a state senator, 
for her 40 years in office, had a primary attempt that was struck down by the um, that was stricken down by the laws here, but is but he is now running under the DF, the WFP ballot line, and I just wanted to give him a huge shout out for finally showing some opposition to a senator who constantly goes against the will of the people here. So I just wanted to bring that up since he wasn't able to be here today. Now, my speech, let me pull this up. When I first came to my college, 2019, before the COVID crisis, they asked us during our, um, they asked us during the orientation, what your three whys are. Why are you here? And I thought today, I'd bring up my three whys for why I started Justice Middlebury. First one is systemic racism. All across America, we see, we see all these incidents of police violence. I mean, me as a privileged white man, I saw what was happening and I was angered. And yet at first I thought, why would I start a movement in Middlebury when the population is 96% white and would probably not be receptive to this sort of messaging? And I look to groups like Justice Southbury, like Power Up CT, like all of them. And I, and I realize that it's important to have a group everywhere in every corner of this state because systemic racism does not stop depending on what town you are in. It is everywhere. So that is my first reason. My second reason is, I would say, a bit more emotional. It's my grandmother, my nonna. She brought me up, and she was the one that told me to stand up for what is right. And without her, I probably wouldn't be the man I am today for multiple reasons, but I would say the big one is her fight against hate. My grandmother, she was a language teacher at Staples High School. And one day, I think it was around the early 90s, she saw two people in the hallway and, what, and basically what she saw and what she was hearing was that a, a white straight man was basically discriminating against a gay person and basically just going after him for just who he is. And she did not like that and went out, called her out, and admonished him in front of everyone. She didn't care. And without that, the reason why I wouldn't be the man today is because her, her youngest daughter came to me and said, if you ever come out as queer, if you ever come out as gay, you can come to me and I will fully approve, I will fully back you no matter who you are. And that youngest daughter, that's my mom. And to have that as, to have that support as LGBT youth, it, it helped me so much when I came out. So that's my second reason, my nana. My third reason, I, and please mind me, I have to pull out my phone for this one, is because of a man named, oh God, my phone just died. <laughs> my, um, a professor at my alma mater, Michael Schroeder. And the reason why I bring him up, even though he's in a town about like hundreds of miles away, is because he showed me what fighting for what is right looks like. Two weeks after George Floyd died, he started a protest series that went for every day until the 4th of July. Every day he was out there in a town like Anvil, the size of Middlebury. He went out there and he, he just proudly showed that Black Lives Matter even in a small town like Anvil. And now two years later, he just had his 174th rally. 
every single week he kept going. Even if the numbers were going down, he knew that he was standing up for what is right. And I was going to bring up this quote, but basically he was saying that no matter like no matter what people tell him, being called a Marxist, a socialist, a radical, even ironically a racist. He said that those people are the ones who encourage me, who keep, who keep on bringing me out to a small town like Anvil to protest every single week. single week no matter what even at even with his obligations as a professor which is from what I've seen from what I've seen definitely a tireless effort so those are my three reasons why in a town like Middlebury why I went out there and I protested even if I was the only one even if I was the only one there that's my why I'm also going to add the last speaker, I, I think, is um, Mr. Turan uh, from the Common Cause, Connecticut, the importance of voting and why this uh, election is most probably the most uh, dramatic one we've ever had in our lives. Okay, I'm clearly going to make this short. Um, my name is Taryn. I am with Common Cause in Connecticut. Um, we organize and advocate on voting rights. and. I just want to locate myself real fast. As a white, straight man in this country, I would say middle class, um, I recognize that I am in the struggle against white supremacy and that I uh, need to do that with help from others, especially people who are not white. I don't assume that people who are not white are going to help me. I sometimes ask and they can say no. Um, but it, if you don't hear me say I'm in the struggle, it is unfortunately in our society safe to assume that I might not be in the struggle given the color of my skin. So thank you for giving me the time. So one question, um, who here with 100% certainty knows that you are registered to vote in the state of Connecticut? 100% certainty. Okay, are you sure that you haven't moved since the last time you registered? Who's 100% sure that you have not moved since the last time you registered? Numbers are starting to drop. Okay. You're not sure? Then you need to come over and visit the table and we're gonna check. Okay, that's why I'm here. That's it, it starts right here. Every single person who is here does not have permission to leave without being 100% sure that you're registered and that your address is updated, okay? It's very simple. Everybody else has said all the right things. Um, I'm just here to make sure that uh, we take the opportunity to vote. It is a statement of faith to vote. It's like walking into a fire um, where you know it's going to burn because these politicians are going to do bad things no matter what you do and how good they say they are. I understand all that, but it's not about politicians. It's about you. It's about your voice. And your vote happens to be the thing you can do as long as you team up with other people to change this world around you. And so don't vote. Don't register and vote because some candidate is good. Do it because you care about yourself okay that's that's it it's because you care about yourself and you want to make this world a better place so the tables right there we're gonna we can online uh, get your re your registration checked and now one last thing um, just repeat after me 866 let's do that you guys are really quiet 866 still not loud enough the wedding party needs to hear this 866. 866. Our vote. Our vote. 866. 866. Our vote. Our vote. You can call that number 
and they will help you with any voter stuff you might possibly have. If that happens to be closed when you call, they will call you back. What was the number? Okay, thank you very much. Comic Cause in Connecticut is honored to be part of this crowd. Thank you. Was there anybody who did not speak? Uh, we called and they were not here and they have arrived since. Anybody who has not spoken yet that would like to speak? Okay, so then I'm just gonna say thank you all. But um, this is, uh, when Corinne and I started this, we only said this is the first step. This is not with the be all end all, where we all shoot it, uh, say yay, you know, uh, uh, and the chance. We, what we wanna do is to have you guys sign up. So we're gonna have the New Haven County um, smaller conversations, probably be online. Um, but we want to hear you have you guys sign up because what we want to do is we, we've identified the, resolu uh, the issues. We want to be able to come up with the resolutions. And at that point, what we want to do is start looking after the election for the uh, gentlemen and women who are going to represent us and see if there's any legislative champions who will be able to take care of these matters that we have brought up. Um, I'm going to ask on a personal level, um, I am the founder of a group called Not Just Us, N-O-T-J-U-S-T-U-S. -T -S. One of the things I would really appreciate is if anyone's willing to co-administer the group with me, sometimes people get uh, denied uh, their, uh, their entry. They put, post something into the thing and it gets automatically denied by Facebook, but I'm not aware of it because it's, I work full time. I, um, I only speak on behalf of myself, not my employer. But I work full time. I have three fam uh, children, um, so it's a full. T it's, I'm like a, doing what I do is a full time and then a uh, job, and then coming after and trying to minister the group is also a very hardship as well. I would really appreciate it if you know somebody who's willing to get involved and to help me administer the Not Just Us group. It was the Not Just Us group was formed uh, as a. Uh, uh, when um, I was invited to a Rocky Hill meeting, in the Rocky Hill meeting, there was all white people there. And they were talking about, uh, there was a gentleman uh, from Wallingford by the name of Craig Fishbein. And he was starting to really rally up the kids, uh, rally up the crowd, saying that the uh, cars were being stolen by black, brown, foster, all these other youths. And he had, no, uh, he had no knowledge of that, but his uh, hate was really spread throughout the whole state. So that was the reason why I wanted to do this rally and the other rallies is because I want to counter that. We need to be able to end it, not just come out and chair. We need to address it, resolve it, and get laws passed. So that's the real bit reason why we're doing this. This is an introduction. Hopefully you guys all don't leave here without meeting each other. But that was the reason why I started Not Just Us, because my children are black. I have three children, three beautiful children. Um, one is 16, but the other two are, uh, are the younger ones, uh, 12 and 13. And you know what? I was not going to let racism affect my family, because you know what? I'm the father of these kids. And I'll be damned if I'm going to let anybody, uh, you know, uh, be discriminatory or uh, do hate crimes against my kid, you know. And I'm not going to let anybody do it against your kids as well. So that's why I went and I called Corinne uh, Prescott. This was about uh, two years ago, I think about three or four years actually, right, Corinne, when you started coming to Rocky Hill for meetings to get Rocky Hill more inclusive and equitable. I think we've been knowing each other for about four years now. And I thank her because without her, uh, we would not have a major powerful voice in the state of Connecticut. So I thank you all for coming, but please sign up. Uh, what I'm holding in my hands is the pen and paper. We would like to get your contact information so we can have a smaller uh, online meeting and talk about what the resolutions to what has been identified in this meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. And I will give it to Corinne. Um, that's just about it. Um, we're gonna be doing, uh, I forgot, Fairfield County. 
um, next, and then I think after Fair Litchfield Middlesex. and Middlesex and Wyndham. Um, so it's gonna start getting cool. Um, we're gonna continue to show out, show up. Um, and what I'm hoping is that we can, at the very last rally, even if you can't make the others, that all the different speakers, all the different organizations that have represented, perhaps all won't speak, but if we can make sure that we can all show up to the very last rally, um, and then we're gonna be going to the next steps. Um, as a victim of, of a hate crime and understanding, and also being someone who is for abolishing the prisons, um, abolishing police as well, it's kind of hard to think of what kind of legislation could be out there that does not include incarcerating people who commit these type of crimes when you're an abolitionist. Um, and like my lawyer said, it's like really, it goes back to the money. Um, as much as I am also an anti-capitalist, I understand that trillions of dollars have been stolen from black and brown and indigenous people. Trillions of dollars is constantly made as a result of our labor. And so one of the things that I know I would like to see with the different organizations that have represented um, each county is through the winter and next spring, we try to come up with some piece of legislation entitled In Hate Across the State or something around that nature that we can really address some real um, solutions to the systemic issues that we're facing. So as we said, this is not just for us to kind of come together, but it is a way I didn't know many of you. Um, and I know many of you may or may not have heard of me, but now you get to see me in the flesh, I get to meet you. But this is a way that we break down those silos and build a bridge so that way we can join together and try to slay this dragon called white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you. We want to, uh, I had these uh, whiteboards. We want to really thank uh, Power Up Connecticut, Race Connecticut, Justice Alliance, the Anti Racism Coalition of Connecticut, Brian Cody's Brother and Sisters Foundation, uh, Common Cause Connecticut, Unitarian Universalist Church of Meriden, Universal Health Care Foundation, Justice for Dukes Coalition, Justice Southbury, Justice Middlebury, Bristol Anti Racism, uh, and Not Just Us, because we. This is really about not just us. This is an issue we all need to be involved in. Thank you. And I will uh, have this for you to sign. If I don't have your information, um, you know, and you weren't on the speakers list, if you could sign so we can get in contact with you for these smaller meetings. Thank you. And once again, lastly, thank you, John Brown Gun Club, for constantly showing up and making sure that we're safe. Thank you so much. <laughs>